Good morning. I'm Jack Berryman, uh, ACSM historian, and we're here this morning uh, talking with uh, Dr. John Bergfeld. Thank you, John, for coming. Um, this is part of ACSM's Distinguished Leaders in Sports Medicine and Exercise Science uh, DVD series. So first, John, I just want to congratulate you on the D.B. Dill lecture. Oh, thank you. Uh, which you just did this morning. And, Thanks for taking a little time to talk with us today. Well, you're welcome. It was a real honor for me to do the Dill Lecture, something I never dreamed that I would do. Yeah, it's quite a lineup of people yes. <laughs> on those lists. Right, intimidating. Um, I, I just wanted to start with uh, a little bit of uh, your early years. Uh, uh, hometown, where you grew up, high school, uh, where you, I know from your talk this morning, you were active in sports and then uh, maybe take us through college and okay. med school and that type of thing first, and okay. then we'll go from there. Well, I grew up uh, actually on a farm with my grandmother. My mother and father were not around. And uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania, western Pennsylvania, and uh, to my early years, and uh, it was farm life. Uh, it wasn't organized sports or anything like that. I did go to school, but I lived in the country and, and uh, went home after school every day, so there was nothing after school until um, my uh, high school years. And my mother, who... Where, what, where, what town was it, it, New, uh, I lived in Leechburg, Pennsylvania, which is in the country. It's near New Kensington. Okay. A sub, it's it's in close to Pittsburgh, just okay. north of Pittsburgh. And... Uh, but anyway, I uh, rejoined my mother, but things weren't so great, and I got sent to a military high school, Valley Forge Military Academy. And there, uh, it was really a, a training ground for me because I interacted with people of all uh, disciplines and, uh, and sports. And one of the nice things about that school is that you could go out for a sport, and no matter whether you were good or bad, you still were on the team. There wasn't a cut system. And... Uh, Somehow I got interested in sports, and then you didn't play the sport the year round. And I was able to play three, baseball, wrestling, and football mm -hmm. while I was in uh, high school. And that became an important part of my life. That was my extracurricular activity. What was the time frame there? That was all, years. All, that would be 1952 to 56. I graduated from high school in 56. Okay. So then uh, at, uh, in college, I went to Bucknell University where I played football and wrestled. And, uh, and football and wrestling uh, became an important part of my life. My uh, playing, I enjoyed the playing and I and enjoyed the sports. That was my extra activity. And uh, the, I always wanted, I, people always ask, why did you want to be a doctor? I don't know. <laughs> I, there were no doctors in my family. I just always wanted to be. So I was very lucky in high school. I knew that I had to get good grades so I could get into college because I wanted to go to my, and in college, I had that motivation. And I'm, I'm aware I have a granddaughter now who's in college and she's not quite sure what she wants to do. And so I was always, in the background was, I had to get myself into medical school. What did you so, major in? Biology. Okay, so good pre-med. Yeah, usual pre-med uh, curriculum. And then all the courses that were outlined for the football team. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to go into that, right? <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, um, and one of the, the, the nice things that leaps ahead, but my, my, some of my closest friends are my football teammates. They, we uh, just had a 50th reunion of our team. Every player, every senior that was on that team showed up, and we've, wow. we stayed in communication. You know, I, I grew up in Lewistown, okay. Pennsylvania, okay. which is very close to Lewisburg. Berg, yeah. Uh, have relatives in Lewisburg. Okay. But I'm trying to remember who was, what was your league? What was your conference? Who did well, you guys play? Yeah, we played uh, the uh, Patriot League now, <clears throat> but it was okay. Lehigh, Lafayette, Colgate, Delaware, and always uh, three or four, two or three Ivy League schools. When I was there, we played Harvard, Dartmouth, wow. Cornell. That's good. And, uh, and that's what they kind of play now, but the, okay. the, the Ivy League schools are not in there, but they always play two or three Ivy League schools. Okay. And that's kind of fun because I have some friends who played football, one at Cornell and one at Dartmouth particularly, and this year we play both of them, so it'll be a, a good rivalry. We'll have some fun with that. Yeah, so all you were saying, I'm sorry to interrupt, 
fiftieth anniversary. Yeah, for the, football and team. Basically, every showed up. every every senior, all the guys were in my class. Yeah. They every one of them showed up. Fantastic. Yeah, and and we just you know we get better as the years <laughs> go by. <laughs> but uh, and Bucknell was a um, you know uh, of the the fellows on my team. Uh, there's four or five physical education and coaches. One went on to coach at Johns Hopkins University, the football coach and baseball coach. And then two engineers, uh, a couple of lawyers, one doctor. <laughs> and uh, and it, we are a real heterogeneous group of guys, but we had that common denominator of having played the sport of football with all the stresses and strains Absolutely. that came. And I think that makes a binding thing. And, and, yeah. and, uh, I think that that was important to me in college. I didn't realize, now I realize how important it was, and I'm so glad that I, I stuck with it uh, and you know, that we had a thing where we honored our coach, and I wrote him a letter. I said, you know, Coach, two-a-day football practice was tough, but you know what? I've got in tough operations where I'm, you know things aren't going well, and I'm in that operation. I just want to quit, but two-a-day football I got myself through it. If I can do that, I can. Do I can this. do this. <laughs> yeah, and and it's and it's sort of really true, and 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 I so I think sports are an important part of young people's life, uh, and as they get on, it doesn't have to be a varsity sport. It's just participating in Absolutely. sports and exercise. I, I thought it's intriguing, and you've probably thought about it over and over yourself. When did I decide I wanted to be a doctor? Yeah, which you mentioned earlier. You know, I guess you can't really. I know I can't. I I really just as a kid growing up, I can remember Dr. Everwine. Uh, he was one of those doctors that burned the tips of his fingers off with X-ray, and and he had his hardly any fingers. And uh, I can remember him coming out to the farm to vaccinate us all, and he'd come when you were sick. And maybe that's what it was. Yeah. But I just thought that would be because there were no doctors or no medical people at all. My family. Yeah. yeah. The. Uh, and I'm, as I said, I thought it was just lucky because that, whatever that spark was, it just kept me going. You know, if, if I said, oh, I better study a little more so I get a good grade on this test. Now, if I hadn't had that, I probably would have gone out and had a good <laughs> So that was lucky. Well, then yeah. after uh, uh, finishing college, when did you at, graduate graduated from, from Bucknell in 1960. Okay. And then... Uh, Probably one of the luckiest decisions I made in my life was to go to Temple Medical School in Philadelphia. And uh, why I chose that, I think, <laughs> it, could, it was Temple or Penn. And uh, Penn had all these really bright guys and research. And I thought, hmm, I, I, I'm not so sure I want to do that. I just want to be a good doctor. Anyway, I chose Temple. But why I say it was lucky, that's where I met my wife. Oh. My wife was one of five medical students in a female medical yes. students in a class of 120 yeah, that's... and uh, that was back in the days Absolutely. yeah and uh and uh she was the next cadaver over <laughs> everyone remembers their first i remember anatomy. yeah their first well i was actually 10 days late because i had a great job i was a lifeguard in new jersey on the seacoast and and we started medical school before memorial day mm -hmm. or, or labor, labor day, day. Yeah. and uh he said, if you're not here Labor Day weekend, you forget about this job next year. Well, I wanted that job bad. So I cut the first 10 days of medical school. <laughs> and when I came into the room, uh, all my the people that were at my cadaver, there were four. Um, the, uh, they said, where have you been? And I said, well, I've been down on the sea. Oh, I hope you had a good time. And then I looked across, and there was Wilma. My wife's name is Wilma. And uh, so she and I got together, and we were, and we got married in medical school, and uh, and she's been great. My wife is a, is the real doctor. She's been was the first woman president of the Academy of Dermatology, and oh does a big won the she big research award. All, we didn't know. Isn't yeah, that yeah. My wife, my friends all kid me. The real doctor is Wilma. Yeah. <laughs> so your uh, any of your children go into medicine? No, one the lawyer, and the other's a graphic designer. And, the lawyer said, I don't want to work as hard as mom, and she works twice as hard. <laughs> well, you know, just thinking of where you're at there in, the, in that time period, did uh, you run across Joe Wolf? Or? No, no. Okay. I didn't. The, um, because he lived in Philly. Right, right yeah. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, and people always say, well, why are you at Cleveland Clinic? Well, when, 
Wilma was pregnant our senior year in medical school, and, and then, as I said, there are only 5% women, and there was a, a prejudice against women, and especially pregnant women. So yeah. we both had the, the same grades, about the same grades in medical school, and I, when it came time to get internships, I could get it, but Wilma couldn't. So Cleveland Clinic said, you can come here, and in fact, Did they, well, take both of they took both of us, okay. and Wilma didn't have to start till September because she had the baby in August, and they said, you can start in September. And then Wilma grew up in Cleveland, too. So that, that were, it was a perfect, but that's why we're at the Cleveland, and we're still there. We're still there. Yeah, <laughs> and that was 1964. So did you do, so in med school, were they still doing sort of uh, rotations, th third, fourth year? Did, yeah. Did, had you thought about orthopedics all along? Or? Yeah, I, I, no, I didn't. Uh, the, um, it, our orthopedics there, um, John Royal Moore was a real dominant guy, but I thought orthopedics was all angles and things like that, and, and I didn't like engineering and mathematics and things, so I sort of steered away from that. I wanted to be a heart surgeon. That's kind of what I thought. And uh, when I got into clinical practice, and this is the, unfortunately the medical students don't have the advantage we had. You went to medical school, then you did an internship, and then started looking for a residency. <clears throat> now they have to decide on their residency their junior year. My junior year, I would have taken a residency in cardiothoracic surgery. Well, once I went through my internship and actually rotated through it, found out I didn't like that, that all those tubes and all those people in the operating room. Right. And we see it now, our residents, we, you can pick them out. They're just not happy. This orthopedics isn't what they really thought it was. But anyway, I was lucky in that I was able to, uh, did, did a year of general surgery, and that's when we picked our residency. And by then, though, I'd had enough experience, and I was got a little bit involved in being a team physician as an intern. I thought that was pretty good, and that's why I went into orthopedics. Okay. Was, so was your residency then uh, in orthopedics? Orthopedics, yeah. Okay, what, was it three years? Three years, yeah. It's six now. Wow. <laughs> so, and you did it at Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic, yeah. Okay. And then uh, after that, I know you talked about the Navy. And yeah. Then so the, was that the next stop? Or? Right. That was the next. It was 1970, and there was still a draft, so everybody was obligated to go. And Vietnam was cooling off, yes. and it was still there. So orthopedic surgeons, um, <clears throat> we all went in. When I fin I was deferred till I finished my surgical training. And then I went, uh, went in the Navy. And I think because of my sports background and I'd been doing some things as a resident, they were looking for somebody who at least talked the language of sports yeah. to be a doctor. And that's how I got assigned to Naval Hospital Annapolis. So, uh, John, let me interrupt you quickly then. So you didn't see yourself at all at that point as a sports medicine physician? No. Right? I mean, Not at all. Okay. I, okay. Well, I shouldn't say... I. When I was a resident, <clears throat> as an intern, uh, there was a sign on, I moonlighted, like I think everybody did then, <clears throat> in a hospital and emergency room. Now they have emergency room physicians, but then emergency rooms are covered by guys like me, residents. There was a sign, Dr. Matteo said, I would like to have somebody help me with the Wycliffe High School football team. Oh, well, that might be pretty cool. Oh, okay. And uh, be an old football player, so I went there and... Uh, stood on the sidelines, and at the end of the season, the coach came to me and said, you know, couldn't you get some of your other young doctors? But I have some friends that would love to have a guy on the sideline. Sure. So that started it, okay. and I got my friends, and there were about 10 or 15 of us um, looking after high school teams, just all voluntary that was stuff. in the late 60s. Then. Late, so yeah. Still in Cleveland. Right, between 64 and 70. Okay. And then... Uh, uh, the uh, Case, Case Western Reserve University, a famous university, it used to be Case Institute of Technology and Western Reserve. They were separate schools. Case had its own athletic program. And the um, football coach, whom I knew from another thing, that he and the doctor didn't get along, and the doctor didn't like the coach, the coach didn't like the doctor. So the next thing, they called me up and said, when you be? So I spent a year, two years as a doctor for the Case University football team. And that was on my dream sheet when I went in the Navy, I think. Okay, and, so that was already there. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, okay. yeah. so I, 
I, I like doing it, although I didn't see myself being a team physician for professional teams. Okay. So, but being stationed at the Naval Academy was better than Vietnam, yeah. and uh, which is what every, all my colleagues went there. So I, I was very lucky to be stationed there. And uh, then I was the doctor for the team. I was right out of my training, but I was a guy. And I learned by <laughs> on-the-job training. Yeah. And it was fun. I did it. I enjoyed it. And, and, uh, and all the sports, it wasn't just football, basketball, all the sports. And uh, I enjoyed that. And then when I finished the Navy, I came back to Cleveland. So that you were at Annapolis 70 to 74? Three. Three, 70. three years. Okay. Yeah. And I was on the ship for five months. And uh, the, um, but so when I came back to Cleveland, uh, sports medicine was beginning to catch on. As I said in my lectureship, Joe Namath and the president, and it was more and more people were kind of interested in sports medicine. Mm -hmm. So we started a subsection of orthopedics uh, of sports medicine. And, uh, and we held a clinic specifically for athletes and, and then that grew and grew and grew, and now <laughs> yeah. we've got we've got five orthopedic surgeons, ten primary care doctors, and a whole cadre of other people. So, were you involved with the founding of the uh, AOSSM? Well, I in joined. Seven, that was seventy-two. Seventy-two. So I was in the Navy, yeah. but I went to the first. I went to the first meeting of AOSSM, but I wasn't one of the founding guys. Um, I was, but I. Joined it, uh, but I wasn't a founding member. Was uh, Allman involved? Fred Allman was Jack, involved. Was it Jack Houston? Jack Houston, Fred Allman, Roy was Collins. Is Thorndike still no. living? No. Yeah, no. No. Okay. Was Alan Ryan? He, he Alan, wasn't an orthopedist. No, he was a, a, a general surgeon, Alan. Yeah. And I showed his picture at the yeah, Wolf I, Lecture. I, I know him. Knew him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was really... He was one of the real forerunners of sports Absolutely. medicine. He was a real sportsman. Uh, and my good friend Bill Clancy in the Navy, we sort of overlapped one year. So we overlapped a year. Then I left and he took my job. He then went to Wisconsin okay. uh, with Alan Ryan. With Alan, yeah. yeah. So you were right there with that, that really early group in the early, yeah. early 70s. Right. Yeah. Had, had you heard anything about ACSM at that point? Well, yes. When I was uh, when I was a resident from '64 to '70, mm -hmm. in 1968, I think it was, I heard about the American College of Sports Medicine, and they had a meeting at Penn State. Yeah. And I said, "I'm College of Sports Medicine. That ought to be pretty neat." I went there, and Fred Allman was president, so we'd have to look up when Fred was yeah. president. I said, well, he was really a good guy. There was an orthopedic surgeon, was president of the College of Sports Medicine, and they had all of this stuff that was exercise physiology, which I thought was pretty neat. Still a small stuff. meeting, too. It was a small meeting. I think there couldn't have been more than three or 400 people right. at the meeting. Mm -hmm. and, and it was at Penn State, so I could drive up there yeah, from, from uh, Cleveland. And that's when I first had my introduction yeah. to the College of Sports Medicine, and I joined it, and then I started going to the meetings. And when I got out of the Navy... I was in the Navy. I didn't go to any because uh, I was busy. Yeah. But once I got out of the Navy and got to my practice, then I said, you know, I'm going to follow through with this College of Sports Medicine and got interested in it and met some, you know, I, the, the, the men and women that were working there were real scientists, researchers, and really making contributions. I, I really enjoyed my association with them. Uh, we didn't have a lot of basic science. In, well, mine was all clinical stuff and sure. surgery. This was what I thought real sports medicine was about. That really came out wonderfully in your talk this morning. Oh, good. I mean, I could appreciate what you were saying right away about yeah. the science. Right. And I can see where you would have really liked this group Yeah. early on. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jack Wilmore and Dave Costell, uh, Peter Raven. Yes. I saw That's Peter cool. here. Yes. Yeah. They, they were real inspirations to me, those guys. John Sutton. Scientists. Right. Um, so you said, okay, you, were, you came back to Cleveland. Right. Then did you set up your own clinic at that point? Well, I went to work for Cleveland Clinic. And, and oh, that's Cle right. Yeah, Cleveland Clinic is a multidisciplinary yes. clinic, and yeah. we're all employees of the Cleveland Clinic. It's a unique way to practice. Yeah. But So and I've been there ever since. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, we won't spend too much on Wilma. Yeah. But did she... Uh, 
Was she employed there too? Yeah, Wilma and I, uh, when I went in the Navy in 1970, Wilma joined the staff of Cleveland okay. Clinic. She finished her dermatology training mm -hmm. and then she had a fellowship so we were able to live together for a year <laughs> she drove to Washington every day, and I walked across the street to the hospital, which she never lets me forget. Yeah. Anyway, uh, then Wilma went on into her career in dermatology and, and then has really been an outstanding, as I said, president of the Academy of Dermatology and mm -hmm. won their big research award. She's been a – how she does it, I don't know. I'm yeah, afraid to look at her CV and yeah, scare and me. had two children. Two right? children, two yeah. girls. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so when uh, – did you, I'm trying to think what the name is, it, were, were they sports medicine fellows? Yeah. That you, I mean, you've trained so many. You've had so many. Yeah. I saw Rosemary Agostino. Oh, did you? This yeah. This morning. She and I have known each other a long time. Of course, she's in Seattle. Right. But uh, she was probably one of the first She was women. the first, she was the first, well, we started in 1981. Okay. Uh, you know, the resident, you know, what a resident is, they finish their training, they're fully trained, and then... In orthopedics, the more and more we're taking fellowships in hand surgery or joint replacement, sports medicine. So we decided to have a sports medicine fellowship at orthopedic in 1981. And that and had that, to be one of the earliest. That was, not. yeah, we, one of the early, yeah, there were, my friends, we would all get together and say, well, you got to get a fellow, you know, because they're, so we did. And then I uh, hired John Lombardo, who was a primary care doc, and that was a little bit controversial because my orthopedic friends say, look, we're the experts on it. I said, well, I know we are, but family doctors can be pretty good, and they don't go to the operating room. We're the experts there, and they're not. So when I hired John, and then John was a very good guy, went on to become a professor of family practice at Ohio State. He said, we want to have a fellowship in primary care sports medicine. Oh. And Rosemary was the first primary care sports medicine. Okay. Rather than orthopedics, right? So we have traditional, right? So now we have two two fellowships: orthopedics and primary care. Okay. But we worked side by side. We were housed in the same. We had the same meetings and everything. And uh, and and I think that one of the things we taught the guys was and gals is the teamwork. A team physician is really an orthopedic surgeon and a primary care doc working working together. And you had it. You had the model. Yeah. Here. Right, we had the model. John and I were the first ones, and then we subsequently had Bob Dimeff, and we now have about eight primary care physicians. But all our teams have an orthopedic surgeon and a primary care doctor as uh, team physicians. Okay, nice. Yeah, and what I'm really proud of is in my fellows, uh, we've got four that orthopedic surgeon and primary care doc trained with us, mm -hmm. and they went on to, you know, Craig Young was here, uh, very active in the college, and, and uh, he his partner is an orthopedic surgeon to train at the Cleveland Clinic. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. You were talking about being a teacher too, and isn't yeah. it fun to look back? It really is. All these people that have done so well. Yeah. Well, I'm. I'm. We're. We. We had, and I think still do, superb candidates. These were raw material, so to speak. And our job was sort of just say, okay, give them their head and where they're going to go. And some have gone on to be very good private practice doctors, but also there's others that are professors. We've got six or seven of them that are full professors and chairman of their departments. And, uh, and then uh, and team physicians, almost all of them are team physicians for some level. You know, we've got 10, I think, or 12 that are taking care of professional teams. And, and I like to think that we sort of gave them the background to, as I say, we open the door and you either, you can run through it if you want, Do if you get the opportunity. Yours. The ball's in your court, so to speak. Exactly. That right. Was that a two-year program? One year. Oh, one year. One year. Yeah, so a busy. Pretty intense. Yeah, Mike, <laughs> Mike Rao, one of our fellows who's in, in Buffalo, he said he keeps getting asked what the fellowship is like, and he said it's 50% clinical, 50% research, and 50% team physician. <laughs> very accurate. <laughs> yeah. No, they're busy. Our, our fellows are very busy. They, they work hard, and they work right alongside us. And, and, uh, and with the high schools, we can sort of give them their head. They, they follow through. And some of them have never been. The inner city of Cleveland, it's a lot better than it was, but it can be a little rough. 
they'd never been in a neighborhood like that or so and and we've never had a, a single incident of any problem and they say you know what it was really helpful for me to meet these young kids that have grown up in these tough neighborhoods and everything and found out that they're really good kids yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's an important lesson. Yeah, I think it's one of the really, and, the, and the, almost all the fellows will say that to us afterwards. One of the best things they got out of this was to find out what the inner city is really all yeah. about. Um, when did you make your connection with the with the with the Browns? Okay. Uh, your... Yeah, I I was when I came back from the Navy. Uh, I uh, there's Cleveland State University is a state university which is downtown. I was involved with them and became their team doctor. And I, I said, one day I said, you know what, I'm just going to go down and meet Dr. Ippolito, who was the team doctor for the Browns. Oh, okay. And they had their training camp at Hiram College, which is a small yeah, college. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's where their training camp. So I said, I'm just going to go down there and introduce myself to them and say, Dr. Ippolito, I'm Bergfeld, and I work at the Cleveland Clinic, and I've been in the Navy and done all this. that. And, and he said, okay, well, thanks a lot. Well, it just happens that two years later, Dr. Brahms, Mal Brahms, who's still a very good friend, uh, was an orthopedic surgeon. And Mal had a heart attack. And Mal said he, he just couldn't do that anymore. So Ippolito called me up. He remembered you. He remembered me. And by then, I'd been doing some things in Cleveland. We put on a postgraduate course in sports medicine for the trainers and primary care doc. He called me up and says, Bergfeld, I need a orthopedic surgeon. Would you be willing to see the players? Uh, well, I'll think about that. <laughs> yes, I said yes. So he, then he said, nothing more. So I listened to the games on the radio. 19, this was 75. Waiting I, for them to yeah, follow you. Yeah, and I kept thinking. So And, and on Monday, is that what you said? this is 75. 75. So I listened to the game on the radio and uh, and then on Monday morning, <laughs> I get these phone calls. Would you see this guy? So I saw eight or nine or ten Did guys. They come over to the clinic? Yeah, they came to the clinic. Okay. And then uh, and a couple of times, Dr. Polito had his own hospital. But then you could do that. So I went over there a couple of times. Then I went to, uh, I went to, uh, he, the next year he says, well, you know, John, I, I need you on the sidelines here. And because uh, Dr. Polito was one of those docs that did everything. He was a general surgeon. So the next year, 76, I was on the sidelines with Dr. Ippolito. And then he said, John, I, it was sort of like a trial, I'm sure. I want you, I'm tired of doing this job. I want you to be the team doc. So I said, well, that was great. And by then I knew what I was getting into. And so then everybody said, well, what kind of contract? I said, well, I, there was never any contract. Art Modell owned the team. We shook hands on it. And that was it. That was my, that was my contract. And uh, and I let the Cleveland Clinic work out the details of how they were going to, because I was employed by Cleveland Clinic. Right. Okay. Anyway, it was that was, and it, there never was. Now there's big stacks of paper and this that. That was no contract, and that way until '96 when he took the team to Baltimore. So it was all done through the clinic, basically between the Browns and right. the clinic. Right. Right. And I was their doctor, I but I, I stayed with just the medical side of it. Sure. Now, I was very aware of what the marketing contract, but I didn't sit in on those negotiations. Smart I was a decision, right? Yeah, absolutely, because I was just their doctor. I dealt with the medical things, and, and I used to say, I'm the medical doctor. You're the, you're the bean counters. You go work it out. And Art, I think, appreciated that, too. Yeah. yeah. Did, did you then have uh, other physicians that you brought in to, to help you? Yeah. Then I, you know, the model of a primary, an orthopedic surgeon and a primary right. care doc, so I got Dr. Lon Castle, uh, and I asked him if he'd be my medical doctor with me, and he and I were the docs uh, till 1990. Right. And then he he became a cardiologist and really was very very busy. He's still the consultant to the NFL cardiologist. And we then brought in a fellowship trained primary care doctor, Andy Tucker, and he and I. Uh, we took care of the team, and then we, and the Cavaliers too. This I time, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah in '82, Ted Stepien bought the Cavaliers, <clears throat> and John Lombardo and I were the doctors for the Cavaliers. So I was very lucky to have guys like Castle and Lombardo to work with, where I could do, be be the orthopedic surgeon for both teams. I, I should know this, but are you still doing 
work with the Browns? Well, only once, the, once in a teams? yeah, once in a while I'll see a player if there's a question. But I've pretty much turned that all over yeah, to my that's, partners. That's hard work. <laughs> yeah, but I'll tell you, Baldwin Wallace College now, and I always sort of looked after Baldwin Wallace College out of my hip pocket because oh, the the bad. Browns used to train at Baldwin Wallace, uh, and then. Um, when I actually finally turned the Browns over, I said to Baldwin Wallace, well, maybe I could spend a little more time. And now, I'm, uh, I, and that's fun. Uh, I go to the Baldwin Wallace games, help with their physicals, and a team physician for Baldwin Wallace College, which is a Division three school, has all the sports. And uh, the football game's still 60, I tell the residents, football game's 60 minutes long, whether you're in the Brown Stadium with 100,000, or you're at Baldwin Wallace with 2,000. <laughs> I bet that's fun for you. It's fun. I bet it really is fun. It's fun. The kids are great. And, and the professional athletes are great, too. I, athletes are special. Mm -hmm. And uh, these kids are, are really, they don't have all the peripheral stuff going on. Uh, we have parents, but they're easy. Um, and they play the game because they want to play. They're not, there's no Division financial. Three. Division three. three. And it's nice. a good Division three. It, Mount Union College is a perennial Division three champion. They're in our league. We play in that league. Okay. If we can ever beat Mount Union, we'll probably go all the way. Good. Yeah. Well, uh, were you involved, uh, John, with the early team physician course with ACSM? It's one of the things that I'm most proud of in my tenure at ACSM. We decided, John Lombardo and I said, you know what? We should put on a course for the team physician. And we put on, John and I were the chairman, the first, and then I'd been president, so I had some influence. Oh, right. okay. And I said, we're going to put on a course at Keystone, Colorado. And we put on the first clinical course at Keystone, Colorado for sports medicine that was sponsored by the American College so of Sports this Medicine. This is 80, late 80s. Yeah, I think 87. It's in your book. It's yeah, a, yeah, there's a picture of us at the okay. Keystone okay. with John Sutton and Tombardo and me. Okay. Um, and uh, so we put that conference on. And it, it may have just broken even or lost $100. Well, the attitude of the college was, you know, they were mostly exercise physiologists in this clinical. They weren't sure. And I remember being at the board meeting where they were going to vote whether we were going to do it again. One vote changed it, Peter Raven. He voted for it. And I'll always be grateful to Peter. He had the foresight to see that this could be something good, and look what it's turned out yeah, to be. Oh, absolutely. And it's good. it's wow. been and it, the other one is it's a good course, College of Sports Medicine, but they also co-sponsor it with the American Medical Society and the Orthopedic, and that I'm really really important. really important because yeah. uh, because I tried to strive to get these organizations to talk to each other, yes. and not easy on both sides. Well, you were in a key role. I mean, geez, yeah, what, you know. Yep. Being an orthopedist and president of ACSM right. and involved in maybe all three, at least two right. of the groups. Well, then, um, the, yeah. The, well, the Orthopedic Society, I carried that same message. I wanted, and now they have an exchange lectureship. Oh, nice. uh, and if you look at in the program, the AOSSM has an exchange lecturer here, and likewise, ACSM has an exchange. And what I'm really proud of is the exchange lecturer is one of my, my, uh, uh, residents, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So he's uh, a, he's going to give the AOSSM uh, address and then then the uh, AMSSM. So that exchange lectureship goes both ways, That's and that was idea. something else that that I I'm very proud of because I kind of got that initiative going, and it's it's thrilling to see it still carried on. Yeah, um, were there other groups other than the ones you mentioned? sponsoring any kind of team physician course? Or do you think this was sort of the, the first that just I yeah. about going? The, the real team physician course, no. They were sponsoring courses on sports injuries. Oh, specific things. Yeah, like but, knee injuries, shoulder injuries, but not the concept of team physician, right. like how to do a history and physical, how to take care of a team on the road, you know, the psychological things yeah. that, that team. No, that was the first. Did the... Um, Team physician guidelines and all that come out of that. Yeah, down the way. Well, we were sitting around at, at uh, and it might have been an NATA meeting, but we said, you know, we should put together the guidelines. We we'll get all these people that are participating in Stan Herring yes. has carried the ball and championed it, 
and since then we've had about 15 consensus conferences uh, and just most recently went over what you know compared the team position to 15 years ago we've just made a new one so that came out of uh, this was a fertile territory the ACSM where that came from and they were the, they were the leaders, really. yeah Yep. Was that a two-day deal, the first one? Or the first one was that? three days at, at Keystone. It was a destination. Yeah, the other thing is there was a, the, the prejudice. Well, you're having it in a ski resort. But we learned in orthopedics, if you have it at a venue like that, the people come. Everybody says, oh, they're going to go ski. We had the meetings from 7 in the morning till 9.30. And everybody went skiing, came back at 4 o'clock. So, Everyone's pretty refreshed. And... Actually. and yeah, and we took attendance. Now, at the orthopedic meeting, we took attendance. We had 90% attendance. You usually don't get that at a meeting. So we convinced our orthopedic. I knew that it would work for the orthopedic. Well, in the college, when I say the college, I mean the College of Sports Medicine, there were people who saying, well, you can't have it. I said, well, I tell you, it, it will work at a resort area. Now, that when they have that, they always have it in some place where people will come and come to the meeting and and there's, uh, a, there's another draw there. there's another draw but they it doesn't detract from the academics if you have it in cleveland ohio <laughs> forget about it <laughs> I, i'm busy that day right? yeah well they used to have them in cleveland new york city yeah. but these are sports things and the people that come to it are involved with sports and usually they're sort of sportsmen themselves so if there's a golf course nearby or you know a place where they can we even had a rugby game at one in Arizona. That's not the one where you broke your wrist. No, that was that was Lyle McKaylee put on a postgraduate course. Yeah. But we did have one at one of these uh, clinical conferences in Arizona, and we arranged a rugby match afterwards. I have a lot of questions where the time's flying. Uh, just, okay. Just a quick question, okay, Jack. John. Um, tell me a little bit about arthroscopic surgery and what an advancement. That must have been when I was looking at those slides of those knees and you know the incisions. Yeah. And, I mean, could you just talk a little bit about it because you you know what it was like before and after. Right. The um, and those were all my patients. I showed those pictures yeah. of. Yeah. Okay. The um, what arthroscopic surgery did. We we learned that it wasn't the structures on the outside of the joint. It was this cruciate ligament, and and then we were opening the knee to repair it. But what the arthroscopic surgery has allowed us to do it through small incisions and to uh, repair the ligament or to substitute for the ligament. And it, it, it decreased the morbidity, uh, the operating room time, and we could actually do it better yeah. because we could see it better with the, uh, with the uh, arthroscope. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so the knee was the first. And then now what we do in the sh and we've started looking in the shoulder and we saw things that we never knew about before. So it's been a diagnostic, therapeutic, gigantic tool. That's what I, I've always thought, but I've never really asked. Yeah. There was a that really saw both sides of this invention. Right. Well I can remember and then it's part of the old boys. The old boys minisectomy, an arthroscopic minisectomy now is an outpatient procedure through tiny little incision. Well they said, well I can take that meniscus out just as fast opening it up and closing it. That was true at first. We had a big learning curve, but we stuck with it. And now, now we say the residents don't know how to do an open meniscectomy. Yeah. They just know how to do it with the arthroscope. It's unheard of now, right. basically. Yeah. Um, well, anyhow, so what's, what's in your future? Are you thinking about retirement? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I, I stopped doing surgery two years oh, ago. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. And when I did that, my colleagues, the chief of surgery at the clinic, said, listen, Bergfeld, you're going to not do surgery, but I said, I'm going to continue to see patients. That's one thing nice about sports. You can always, there's always lots of patients to see. So I'm going to have outpatient clinics. He said, well, I need somebody to, to come into the operating room who's been here, who everybody knows, who can help coordinate and make the operating, room, operating rooms run efficiently. And, and I thought... Well, all my, my, my surgeon friends said, are you crazy? What do you, you know, that's a herding cats yeah, <laughs> job. Right. And, and getting the surgeons, nurses, and anesthesiologists to work together. But I said, you know what, that'd be something new, and, and it'll be different. And I said, yeah, I'll take the job. 
So I started off, uh, I was still doing surgery when I started the job, 20% of my time. Now it's 75% of my time. And uh, we have 75 operating rooms at Cleveland Clinic that start every day. So we, we coordinate the, the scheduling. And then I deal with the issues in the operating room. You know, if we've got a surgeon who just comes late all the time, I sort of sit down and talk to him. And uh, with the uh, <clears throat> Health Care Reform Act, there's a lot of things that are we get inspected in the hospitals, which we didn't five or six years yeah. ago. So my job is to get things ready and make sure we're doing things right. Um, and uh, and I kind of enjoy it. It's it's different. It's not sur I miss surgery, but I I'm, my office I have my office in the outpatient clinic, but I have an office right in the surgery, it's like an anesthesiologist. So if there's an issue. Yeah, the surgeons, and they don't hesitate to come in and say, Bergfeld, oh, you know, my operating room is gone. They're not doing this. Not doing this. So I listened to it, and I said, well, I've been there, done that. <laughs> so I, 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 I'm uh, enjoying that job, and it's a, it's a unique. It was a unique opportunity because I think as I look at my clinics, just doing the outpatient clinic, I think I would start getting bored. I'm not bored with this job. Yeah, I got this it, it, every day. Moment. Yeah. Every day a new challenge. Exactly. Well, John, I told you the time would go really yeah. fast. Thank you so much. Okay, Jack. Well, thank you. I'm very honored to be doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.